So uh, next section here, we're going to talk about the Zurus architecture. I'm uh, Bruce Miller, VP of Product Marketing, and I'll be joined by uh, Dirk Gates, our, uh, our uh, executive chairman and founder. And we're going to be look, diving into the architecture of the Zurus Array products. So uh, there's some unique elements about what we do. Um, and I want to make sure that we're able to have a good dialogue um, with you in terms of understanding what we do some of the nuances, some of the, of the, of the differences um, in terms of the directionality of the antennas and some of the things that we do with respect to that. So I'm going to uh, turn it over to Dirk to introduce the, uh, the product line. Sure. Thank you, Bruce. I'm uh, Dirk Gates, founder and executive chairman of Xerus, and this is the, uh, the fun section. We've got slides. I'm just going to use that as wallpaper in the background because, more importantly, we have toys. So here, and I'll pass this around, this is the, uh, the big boy. This is a controller, the center board here. In fact, oh, you didn't pull. We'll have to find a screwdriver. You guys can take this all the way apart. Center controller here, this is a six core Cavium network processor with four one gigabit uplinks plus the, op the option to add a 10 gig fiber or copper uplink. And it has 16 PCIe slots, each of which can hold an individual uh, radio card, or we call it an integrated access point. So I'll pass that around. This is a uh, dual band. That particular one is a 3x3 802.11n access point. You can populate up to 16 of those in this chassis. These can be uh, depopped, can be upgraded, can be changed out. Um, likewise, in fact, you know, I'll go ahead and pass this around so you guys can take a look. And if uh, someone over here has a screwdriver so they can take them apart even further, that'd be fun as well. Are, are they hot swappable or I have to shut, shut down the AP down? They're not hot swappable, you have to shut the, uh, the AP down. Do they require any sort of recalibration once you started monkeying with the radios or do you just you pop the shield, plug in what you want and go? Pop them in, we would note. So no, no recalibration necessary. Pop them in and away you go. Our first generation products, uh, it was a little more difficult to swap the modules so we actually had uh, a design that required you to bring them back to a, uh, a partner or send them back to the factory to have them swap. These were specifically designed to be user, uh, user swappable, not hot swappable uh, in the field. Field replaceable. This is uh, the, uh, the small, uh, smaller brother. This is an eight slot controller, quad core Cavium processor, dual gig uplinks, eight of these slots, same modules, same radio modules, populate this device, but this is up to eight radios. And pass these things. Can we take that one apart? Okay. And then I'm not going to necessarily take them all apart, but it goes down to four slots, and this is a, a two radio device. Across the product line, it is the same, <laughs> same set of radios um, and the same software that runs up and down the product line. And so some of the... Uh, some of the challenges you run into packing this many radios in a device, I'm sure you guys have had some experience where you get access points crammed together uh, and they don't cooperate. One of the biggest challenges is you really don't want to, traditional access points are going to force you to have one 2.4 radio for every access point. And 2.4 gets overpopulated very quickly. Each of these devices, even up to the 16 radio device, out of the box, the 16 radio device only has three radios at 2.4 separated on channels 1, 6, and 11. The rest are on channel on the 5 gigahertz channels. Um, in addition to that, if you'll notice with these modules, that's, the, uh, that's a 3x3 three three going around there. This is a 2x2. Two two. The, the antenna design is something we've, we've fo focused a lot of our time and energy on for the directional nature of the antennas. We've got a, a, an, an antenna design group, and we've got one guy that's you know, older than Earth himself that's been doing this for, for seems like decades. But the design is something that's, uh, that's very critical to get the, the sort of isolation and the directionality you're looking for. Here's the eight radio device and you can see the controller board on that. So right off the chute, one of these antennas adjacent radios has about a 50 dB isolation between them because of the antenna design. Non-trivial to get that. But even more importantly... 15 or 50? 50, 5, 0. Yeah, 15 is not enough. Because of the antenna design. Because of the antenna Not design. because of the big old baffles? The, well, that's part of the... This is, this oh, okay. is, this is all considered part of the antenna. All right. Everything hanging off the end of the card. Yeah. 
And then that isolation goes up as you increase your angular distance between radios up to about 120 degrees. You actually have a back lobe, so at 180 the isolation starts to come down. So one of the uh, clever pieces of software in the control <coughs> is a channel planning algorithm that tries to create maximum angular separation between adjacent channels. And in this particular case, it has knowledge of the antenna pattern, so it's trying to space adjacent channels ideally at 120 degrees apart. So with these, with these products, it's important that you let the controller itself do a channel design um, in, its, uh, in its most um, comprehensive form, the channel assignment software first tunes every radio to the same channel and listens and does that through all the channels in, all, in both spectrum, creating a sort of a traffic map with directionality baked into it. How long does it take for that to settle out and that, then to adjust to it? it that runs, the, the entire process takes less than a minute, but you know, typically around 45 seconds. So if you're doing a, the comprehensive channel design, it'll do the listening, all the arrays at the same time generate this traffic map based on location, based on directionality, and then spend a lot, a lot of time crunching the numbers to figure out how best to organize the channels on any one of these devices to get maximum angular separation between adjacent channels to be able to get you best isolation. And that's sort of a, a very complex algorithm that we wrote many years ago to be able to handle this uh, array sort of uh, a, approach to deploying Wi-Fi. Dirk, can I interrupt you? Um, sure. Just a Twitter question came in and I won't word it quite this way because it wasn't <laughs> real kind, but I'm sure you get this and I've had past conversations with Xeris on the products. Just the antenna isolation thing, you got to get challenged on that a lot because they're in such close quarters. I know you I know you say it's, you know, simple antenna design, but can you say anything more about it to put people's minds at ease? Well, so the, when, at the end of the day, what we can really do is point to guys like Shane that have deployed these things in large places, large auditoriums, and can take a look at the amount of traffic that can pass through that. We have labs at headquarters that have up to a thousand devices in fixed locations around these things, and we can, we can fill all four gig pipes on the 16 radio device, we can fill the dual gig pipes on the, on the 8 radio device. So we're able to actually demonstrate the ability to pass that much traffic through these things. So I mean, it, it's interesting to get into the physics and we could have an entire course on antenna design and how the whole thing works, but at the end of the day the proof is in, uh, is in the pudding and the devices are able to do what they're saying. And, and we've, we've cut our teeth on probably Wi-Fi's most difficult challenge with the large, uh, dense uh, convention centers and areas, but then we've taken that same technology down into these smaller devices. Do you find your? I'm sorry, to, I know you wanted to go to Keith, but do you find yourself actually getting challenged a lot, or is it more just down in the grass? People, you know, you catch wind of people challenging the ability to pack so much under the hood, or do you, do you ever face full-on frontal assaults on the topic? You know, it. it Earlier, I think before we had enough reference customers and enough proof points in the industry, it was more of a technical discussion. But now we have enough reference customers, um, folks at large companies doing very large events that clearly are having success with this approach and when they've had very difficult times with 2 ap So less of an issue now. People aren't as interested in having a detailed technical discussion. They want to talk to people who have actually solved the problem. You just said the proof's in the and the net result, wouldn't the proof actually be if you surveyed, say with air magnet or something, should you see directional patterns on the ground? So the question was in, in regard, what are you going to see? So just for uh, everybody's, so we get everybody on the same page, when you design an antenna, you generally have a forward lobe that's directional, but you're also going to end up with a back lobe and sometimes you'll end up with side lobes. And when we talk about a directional antenna, we talk about the angle of directionality. If this is 100% power at the tip, if I've got a 30 degree beam width or a 60 degree beam width, what that really means is when I'm out here at 30 degrees off, I'm basically at 50%, I'm at the half power point. 
So this is half power. So these antennas at five gig have about a 60 degree beam width, which means they're gonna drop half power 30 degrees off axis. Plus they're gonna have a back low. So when I go out to survey, I'm not gonna see, you, you might expect, and some customers do, that you're gonna see this. Nothing outside, power in one direction. The reality is between the back lobe and multipath, you're going to see the signal. It, it's going to be, you're going to see it in, in all directions, but you'll see a difference in power. As you come around to the side and go to the back, the power is going to drop down. What it allows is for the client, when he's doing his scan of the, of the available radios, he's going to be able to pick the one with the highest signal strength and he's going to be able to get the one that's, that's aimed in his direction. And one of the other pieces that's nice is that these antennas not only amplify the transmit power, but they also have receive gain as well. So we're able to hear the client better in that direction as well. That's one of the other questions we frequently get is, is there a, a, a link imbalance? Just because I can shout louder in that direction, can I hear the laptop? And the answer is yes. Think, think of a megaphone. I put it up to my mouth and I talk, I get amplification going out. If I put it to my ear, I get amplification coming back in as well. One, one thing uh, just to follow up on that is, is with respect to directionality, I think the best way of doing a survey, because I know you've done some surveys, is take it outside into an open area with no reflections, you know, in the desert or whatever. We do this with our products to test them. And that will show you the, the full pattern of the of the survey, of the, of the antenna, and exactly what it's doing. When you put it indoors, there's obviously reflections and other things happen to, you know, change what it looks like on, with respect to the survey. Um, but the, you know, the antennas indeed are directional, you know, four to six dB of gain depending on, on the type and the band, you know, but, but the characterization is ultimately done in a, you know, a, a non-reflective environment. Um, and then when you go indoors, this pattern won't look this way, obviously, and you'll get a different result in your survey. So I've actually done We'll send surveys that have been done of Xeris in uh, Convention Center, which is, isn't a desert, but is a fairly wide open space without a lot of reflectivity. And I've not seen this pattern in the surveys that I've done. And again, well, it depends on how you're surveying and what you're seeing, but you're going to find that the signal, you're, you're not, it's not that you won't see the signal behind the array. There's going to be a back lobe. There's going to be signal mm -hmm. back there. Well, the, this, from what I could tell from looking at the results and looking at individual radio channels on the results, it looked like an omni signal to me. It didn't look like a mm -hmm. type of directional signal at all. Depends on your distance from the array, and it depends on the, the survey uh, techniques and mm -hmm. tools. We have, we have uh, our own you know, antenna, obviously, patterns that we've measured. So, I mean, we could share those with you and you can see kind of what we've come up with. I mean, that's a good way of Be doing it. interested in seeing that. Yeah, because I know that, you know, this is not highly directional. 90 degrees, 60 degrees, 120 on the two four channels. That's not very, very point directional. It's not, you know, a 14 dBi, 20 dBi antenna that you're going to be doing a point to point link with. So you get directionality, but you ultimately have to fill up a, an omnidirectional coverage pattern. So we design the antennas so if I put three or four for, you know, say this smaller array, you know, back to back in a circle that I get omni coverage. I, I guess the other thing that was more concerning to me with that survey was the amount of interference that I was seeing. It seemed to be very high. Now is that according to their magnet? Yep. Or, the, or the survey tool? Air magnet, yes. Yeah. Now, what we've seen a lot of times with those tools is they're, they're not used to a Xerus product, right? So they're not, they're not architected to show that. So when you do an interference display on something like that, you may be getting a false reading because it's not used to having coincident radios all in the same location, right? But so how can that's you call, why we ended up making our own survey tool. How can honest. you call that a false reading, though? I mean, 802.11 is 802.11, right? If you're pulling those noiseful readings off of a reference card or off of a client adapter, noise floor is noise floor. Well, are you talking noise floor or co-channel interference? Co-channel interference. Co-channel. Because wouldn't in your picture, if you, yep. if you were behind the array on the opposite side, you know, if that missing one was going that way and I was over here, couldn't I hear that one and associate to it? You sure. can, and sure. you can associate to it, so depending on your distance. So as far as clients are concerned, you could still be omni around it and have connections, Absolutely. plus some people over there get a little further distance. Correct, yeah. and the clients will tend to, tend to 
prefer the ones with a so stronger single strength. And we have a load balancing algorithm as well that would tend to steer them to the ones where we're hearing the loudest RSSI from them. So if a client's on this side, would the device would try to move him to this radio rather than the one that was on the right. other side? This is a typical scenario we see like in uh, schools. You get uh, a hallway, classrooms well, over here, don't all Don't obliterate your kids. that red one yet. I still have a question there. Ah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> And, and an array out here, you'll, you'll, all, the, all the, uh, the students are here. You have arrays pa facing in multiple directions. The load balancing algorithm will distribute them around here because likely even this radio here pointing this direction is being seen by someone over here at a decent signal level based on the, on the patterns that we're, we're, we're seeing there. So it, it, you know, indoors, there's reflections, there's directionality, um, but it's not going to showcase itself in this kind of view when you do the survey. Could the client, that's in, say in the, in the bottom right classroom, still connect to that radio pointing the opposite direction? Yes. Dep depending I mean, on it distance. depends how far he weighs. You know, this, this only might be 50 feet, so. So how, how would you load balance that client in that classroom to the correct radio? So with 802.11, one of the, the biggest challenges I'm sure you guys are all aware of is that sadly the client makes a decision a lot of decisions that the infrastructure should be making. So the best we can do today is try to persuade him by taking a look at where he's been probe requesting, looking at his various RSSI, looking at what types of stations are associated to which radios. So if I know you're 5 gig capable because you've probe requested a 5 gig, I'm going to basically tell you anytime you try to associate to a 2.4 radio that it's full. I'm going to do that for a few times. If you beat your head against that wall, I'll let you in but I'll basically deny you access to a 2.4, trying to coax you to go to the 5. Same thing with the single strength. If I know that there's a radio that you're going to be better on because of the, because of the single strength and it's in the right band, I'll deny you access to some of the other ones for a few times when you probe request or when you try to associate, and then I'll eventually let you in. So the, ultimately, this is one of the things we should work on as an industry. We need to shift those decision, all that decision making from the client back to the infrastructure. You know, unfortunately, I'm one of the culprits. We were at Zircom back when the standards were being written, and we were client-centric. Shame on us. Now I'm infrastructure-centric, and those decisions should definitely be pushed to the infrastructure. So, so, oh, so you're, you're claiming this great radio isolation between wedges of your pie chart in one breath, but then you say, yeah, when you use a directional antenna, you've got these great side lobes, and so when you visualize it, you're going to get these side lobes. Well, side lobes and radio isolation... The, the, those are mutually exclusive, right? How can you claim to have one, but then it, in one breath, but in the other one say, oh, but when you visualize it, you're really going to get RF dumped out to the sides. So what I, and great question, what I, what I explained earlier is there are, there are points along here where you have better isolation because you're, you're in between lobes. And that's why I was talking about our channel planning algorithm that knows the antenna pattern and the angles at which you have maximum isolation and tries to make sure that adjacent channels within the array when they're, when they're assigned to radios happen within those dead spots around the lobes. So that's part of it. I mean, that's the, you know, there's a lot of it comes into... And, and what's the other part of it, right? Because there's got to be more than that. Even if you have two 5 gigahertz AP sitting right next to each other, you can't just say, oh, because one's on 36 and one's on five or six channels up or what, you know, however you're going to do your isolation from a channel perspective, right? You still don't have perfect radio isolation or even great radio isolation yeah, and, and at the, at because the end they're right the, next to each other. And at the end of the day... The answer is you put an array in the middle of a room with, a, with clients surrounding it and I can maintain maximum data rates and get, get two or three hundred megabits per second off of each radio. <coughs> so without having to go into all of the technical details, which frankly some of them are beyond me, I can, show, I can demonstrate the ability to have that many radios in the five gig band talking to clients at high speed. And as they're pointing over here to Shane and others, we have plenty of customers that can uh, testify to that as well. So, so I think we're all interested in the nuts and bolts, not the, not the okay. don't worry your pretty little head about it uh, <laughs> approach, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, well, excuse me, the proof is in the pudding approach, I suppose, right. is what it should be called, right? Um, I, I, I think everybody here would love to know more. Sure, yes. well, mm -hmm. very much so. I think, you know, the, the answer, the, I mean, without, again, yeah. We can hold an entire RF design seminar, and I'd have to get a different group of people. We do have there. Wireless Field Day 6 coming yeah, up. Yeah, so two sessions for Zerus. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get the antenna design group up here, and we'll and have quite the honestly, I mean, the, the best 
um, sessions that we've had at Wireless Field Day from our point of view <coughs> have been the ones that have been very, very technical ones with people like antenna designers tracking. and that kind yeah, of thing. I haven't asked that yet. <laughs> 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 mm -hmm. well, well, that's that. a question good question about how you do the triangulation of clients in relation to the access point if you have all these different arrays and is there a brain in the middle that puts this together? And the answer is yes. That's mm -hmm. part of the part of the uh, XMS. Uh, it's not really a controller. It's more of a management system. But all of the arrays report data back up to the XMS, um, and not only from the radio that the the station is associated to, but as the station's probe request, we'll hear those on other radios, and we'll get directional, more directional information from those probe requests that is fed into the same locationing uh, algorithm. So, in a, in in addition to what you'd normally get from locationing, just having multiple omni antennas listening and triangulating. You have to hear it at a general signal you, strength. Now you, you have multiple arrays within a, within a location, okay. and each one is getting multiple cuts at a location because you have directional. Mm -hmm. So I know at this angle I'm receiving this RSSI on a probe request, at a different angle I'm getting a different RSSI. Yeah. So, so for the devices that are probe requesting, we actually get more location data. Yes. A quick question around RRM and location of multiple arrays. So, you know, assuming that we have this directionality to each each radio, how do you plan for for channel reuse and things like that? Where I'm eventually going to have places where, you know, those directional overlays places. come into place. Yeah. yeah. Right. So there's there's two methodologies there. One back to the XMS with an XMS in the center. It does sort of a master channel plan throughout the, uh, the entire uh, deployment. Um, and in addition, the arrays, we talked about the ability to tune all the radios to the same channel, listen, and, and then build up a traffic map. We also have an algorithm to allow you to, to do that with a single array at what edge of the deployment and then move that through the deployment so that each array is listening to the channels as they're being broadcast off the other arrays and then picking a set of channels that steers them away from the other ones. Well, so, so I, guess, I guess my question comes down to is that because we're directional, right, mm -hmm. I have same channel on two different arrays or, or multiple arrays, um, they're probably not pointed at each other like this. Correct. They're most likely pointed at, pointed at this, and they're not hearing each other directly, right? So... Um, In most of our deployments, they actually, you know, adjacent array, we very, very infrequently do have arrays so far apart that they cannot hear each other at low data rates. Usually at six megabits per second, we're, we're able to hear um, management traffic from the other arrays. Well, well, I understand that, but I mean, you've got a hot spot out there someplace where I've got two channels that are, you know, t two radios that are on the same channel in one location, and they're not pointed at each other. So while I can still hear the management frame, um, I'm, I'm going to have pockets where, you know, I s essentially have small pockets of. Um, uh, common collision domain, right? And the ne not necessarily the radios are not going to hear each other because the client is going to be sitting out in a pocket that is non not line of sight between them. That, does that make sense? <coughs> I, I suppose I don't know that, that I don't know that we ever see that in practice. Generally, with the way the out the channel planning algorithm is is working is that the radios are pointing at least ninety degrees or are are higher apart. If you look at the result in channel plan. You don't, you don't often get them pointed in such a fashion that they're, they're going to be pointed at each other in any, yeah, in well, any sort of sense. Typically opposite. You know, yeah, if you have two adjacent out. arrays, that's the ideal position, and, and the algorithm will pick that, or you could tune that accordingly. Another, another point on this whole topic, though, that I don't think we got into was, so you, you do an optimal channel plan. That's, that's key to, to all this, but also the, the power. So if you're in a point. dense environment, you're not worried about coverage, right? Most, most designs today are not worried about coverage when it comes to Wi-Fi, it's about capacity, which means you're trying to pack things in tighter and tighter, which means you typically start to look at the power control pretty quickly in a large environment. And Mike can talk to that later, but you're typically ratcheting down the power, the transmit power on the radios. Uh, in fact, we actually have the capability of taking that under zero dBm. We can go down to negative 10 dBm which goes beyond what most other manufacturers, or 15, uh, most other manufacturers do because we find that kind of small cell uh, approach and then you raise the receive sensitivity, you can, you can uh, start to, to really get some capacity and channel reuse by, by that architecture. So combination of channel design, tight power control, um, and then obviously the directionality of the, of the radios, the built-in isolation, all of those add up to you know, solving this problem. It's not a perfect world. We're not, 
obviously bending physics or doing anything <laughs> perfect. And, and you know, there is going to be some interaction, obviously. But, but you know, again, back to the proof of the pudding, we do have you know, arrays that uh, eight radio one. We've had you know, a scenario with close to 900 users in one convention you know, all working at the same time. Um, so just a clarification so sure. I make sure I understand and then I'll ask my question. Um, so channel planning for uh, between two arrays is all done just by sensing the air, right? There's no communication between the arrays themselves? There's a, there's a combination of sensing the air and the XMS, the central management system, uh, is, is uh, part of the channel planning algorithm as well. Okay. So there's, which, central, there's central input. Okay, which leads to uh, uh, the next question, which is um, how does inter-array roaming work for, from the client perspective? Great or, question. What kind of communication happens there? So, when the, the, so the arrays communicate with each other, both over the wire and over the air. So over the air, we embed information elements in the beacons and in the probe request, probe response transactions between arrays to help us sort of fingerprint the RF in the building. So every, every array is basically pinging the other arrays that are within earshot, then we can sort of develop um, an RF fingerprint of what's going on. That all factors into the cell sizing and the channel planning. Over the wire, depending on how it's configured, the arrays will actually communicate with those arrays that are adjacent to it and pass station information, so you end up with a shared station table. They'll pass authentication information to help us uh, assist in roaming. Um, and they'll also keep, thing, keep other pieces of, of what would normally be done in a central controller synchronized between the arrays. And so there's a, there's a very complex algorithm over the wire that's doing all of that synchronization, making what is a controller's network look like it just has one giant networked controller. So, yes. Um, and this is not necessarily a zero specific uh, question. It's more of a question from an industry state of things. When we talk about 8211 AC, um, sort of the state of the technology today is just awful from a client perspective, right? Things like lack of DFS support in the vast majority of adapters. So when you talk about um, architectures that are built around high density, high capacity in leveraging a, a significant number of five gigahertz channels, what's your take on um, where the industry is going and how long that's going to be a, a problem, right? If our launch products are just so terribly awful and everybody's screaming about it at 11 AC and it's the way we're going and it's the next, uh, you know, it's the next step of uh, high density and you know, fill in the blank as far as um, whatever you're going to say. Um, how long is that going to be a problem, in your opinion? So, if I understand the question correctly, so, so this transition to AC, you know, how is that going to pan out? Let's let's go back and take a look at the transition to 11N, um, and we had similar issues that when we were getting getting 11N into the market first. They're very early products. They didn't have all of the capabilities. Mm -hmm. um, and it took a while for that to, to smooth out. And I'm going to take a look at the 11N transition and say it was two or three years before you really saw sort of pervasive 11N usage that you were getting what you expected from it. Early on, if I go back to as early as 2007, 2008, I would say some of the early 11N was underwhelming. And it took it took till nine or ten before you could really say, "I'm getting, I'm getting what I'm expecting out of my 11N." Right, but aren't we setting the stage for that today, especially from a client support perspective? Right, we, um, when we talk about you know crappy clients coming out on the market, we're going to have to support those for a really long time, which basically blows all sorts of holes in anybody's high density discussion from a five gigahertz perspective. There will be crappy clients, but and and color me optimistic, the, the leap between N and AC is a smaller leap than between ABG and N. N introduced MIMO, introduced multiple TXRX chains, introduced all of those issues that made the implementations more complex and initially more costly. The good news with the AC is, is we've spent years working out MIMO and the rating algorithms and the code and the hardware to do all that well. And the other nice, nice thing about the AC transition that we're seeing is that most of the parts that are coming out actually are cost down. If you look at the Broadcoms and the Atheros and the Intels of the world, they're doing die shrinks on their parts so that the actual cost of an AC part is less than the 11N part. So two things I think will happen. 
first of all, it won't be as bumpy because we're not making the big leap to MIMO. Second of all, I think it will go faster. You will see AC adoption occur in devices much faster than you saw 11 in adoption because it's not incremental cost to put in AC. Because of more law, production. right? Yeah. And so you're going to see, so I think those things combined will make the AC transition faster and smoother. Now, am, do I believe for an instant that I'm going to pick up an AC device tomorrow and get 1.3 gigabits per second out of it? No. I think that there are still challenges in frank, frankly today trying to get the full benefit of a 3x3 three three MIMO solution is still a challenge. Uh, it's difficult if you're, if you're trying to penetrate, you know, a single wall will blow you out of the water being able to maintain, uh, you know, three spatial streams. But I think that we'll get a faster and smoother transition to AC uh, than we did with 11N. My, my two cents, I think okay. we're heading down that path. As long as you bring up AC, I'll pass this around. It's not terribly visually exciting. You can tell it's a different antenna, but this is a 3 by 3 802.11 AC radio module that fits in our existing, uh, our existing uh, wireless arrays. Pass that around. Tell so us we, what chipset's in there. That's, that's an Atheros chipset. Okay. Uh, three by three. Uh, the interesting thing about it is, is there, it's a dual band. It's not AC at 2.4, but every one of these radios can do 11N at 2.4 or AC uh, at uh, 5 gig. And is, is that Either or. Today? It's not shipping. So the, in these particular cases, the, the hardware always turns out to be easier than the software. So the software is still under development. And there you go. And we're, uh, we're, we're banging out that. So one of, the, one of the interesting challenges we have from an architectural hardware software perspective is putting that many radios in this device. First of all, f on the hardware side, hanging that many radios off of a common PCI bus gets to be a challenge. So we have a couple of Xilinx FPGAs in the larger devices, the 8 and 16 radio devices, that basically we have to build our own bus controller with uh, fetch ahead and buffering built into it to be able to feed all of those radios. Imagine with 11 AC technology, each one of those radios wanting to pull theoretically a gigabit per second over this bus, 16 of them yanking on the bus at the same time. It takes a bit of, a, a bit of uh, magic and an FPGA to make that possible. In addition to that, most of the stock software drivers you, you get from the manufacturers are designed for one or two radios at best. Trying to run 16 radios in a multi-core environment means a, a radically modified driver to be able to handle multi-core correctly and to be able to handle that many radios simultaneously. The added complexity is when you're mixing 11N radios with 11AC radios. Currently, those are two separate drivers. So being able to load both drivers in memory, have them share the cores correctly, and run simultaneously is a challenge. So that's what we're, that's what we're working on now, and the software QA process will take us a few more months. Mm -hmm. This is probably, you'll see that shipping in Q4. So what's the uplink capable on the back end of the access point with 16 radios doing AC? How many uplinks do you have? Sure, 16, the 16 radio comes out of the box with four gig uplinks okay. and an option to add a 10 gig uplink. That's an important point. Yes. What have you seen with the having 16 radios, even at uh, end speeds today with your four, four one gig uplinks on the back end, then your PCI bus is limited at 2.5 gigs. You know, we talk about we have, your. We have 16 PCI buses. Yeah, so 16, 16 times so 2.5. E, so yep. each one of them is their separate. Yep. I mean, where are you seeing anywhere that you're actually hitting any bottlenecks right now? And then the other part of that also is with four uplinks and all these radios, how many of those are actually pulling PoE? Because you talk about one of your key <laughs> yes. key aspects was is your your lower TCO by not having to have as much of a power consumption. So let's let's answer the PoE question. All of the radios, all of the arrays, eight radios and below, single, single PoE over, uh, over Ethernet. Four radios and below, it's standard PoE. Uh, uh, I believe it was at T will get you there. AT, yeah. Uh, AT will get you there, but uh, the, the eight radio single PoE is a proprietary injector that goes up to 60 watts. Okay. And on the, the larger array, you need to pull two for PoE. 
side. With you having the proprietary PoE injector, I mean, for 60 watts, that's borderline what, what UPoE was as well. Are you looking at going more towards the standards base and getting Absolutely. rid of Absolutely. When the standards come out, we will move there. I mean, yeah, we, we've just, we just end up being there ahead of ahead right. of standards. It's actually standards-based signaling, so you can plug right. an AP into one of our bigger injectors and it'll work. It's just higher power, right. you know, so we're, we're just kind of pushing, obviously, a, a greater capacity over that. So, and then you were asking about bottlenecking. What are we seeing today? Yeah. You know, I th I, there are some cases in some of our larger installations where we put a 16 radio array and we start seeing, I don't know that we've ever filled all four gig ports out the back, but it's getting close. There are some of those things where you're, you've got applications today with video and so forth in, in large settings where you end up having, um, in some cases, close to a thousand or more users on a single array. You can get those four four gigs pulled up, and and Michael, Mike's got a, a segment that'll come up here uh, later on about high density Wi-Fi design. Mike's our engineer who's put together most of our large convention centers and events, um, Salesforce.com, Microsoft events, Google events, where we've had uh, literally ten thousand people in a single room on Wi-Fi simultaneously. Yeah. Yes. First, first uh, any relations to Bill? <laughs> Same industry, that's about it. Okay. As far as I can tell, I, haven't, I have not found one yet. <laughs> uh, you know, I applaud you guys. It's, it's a different way of doing A211, right? Yep. And uh, it's always nice to see you know, vendors, manufacturers go out outside, you know, outside the norm and push the envelope. Uh, but I, I don't want to beat up the whole you know, interference perspective, but you know, from, what I'm, from what I know of carrier sense, multiple access, it, it would seem like you know, the center of the access point is going to be a hot plate, a hot Wi-Fi mess for, for carrier sense. So uh, I would be interested at some point just to learn more, you know, the interference perspective uh, specific sure. to the carrier sense. And uh, any new products coming out with a wider array at all? So the, the area where we've been focused on, on pushing out our product line, started at the high end, we've been building out the low end. So some of our most recent products seem you know, fairly run of the mill. We've got two radio APs with fixed and omni antennas, and we're going to continue to do that and, and, and run AC through the entire product line. In addition to that, we've been focused on more outdoor applications, specifically taking our multi radio technology and building purpose built outdoor devices. Historically, we've built enclosures for our arrays so you can mount them outside, but as we've gotten more involved with and, and heard more customer feedback, from the large public venues. We're coming up with very specific devices that are designed for those venues and designed for outdoor use. Um, in addition to that, from a software perspective, there's been, a, there's been a lot of focus on taking uh, as much of our software capability uh, into the cloud as possible. So moving the XMS, moving the design capabilities, moving all of the different pieces we've had uh, up into cloud-based services, and that's been a big focus on the software side. So those are are the things that we're working on uh, back at the shop. Sure. Thank you. Yep. For your outdoors, I'm just curious, do um, you guys do any kind of mesh outdoors? And if so, how the heck does that work? <laughs> with we, we, how does that work? <laughs> Actually, can work fairly well. When you say mesh, we, we don't have full support for .11S, but we do have uh, simple WDS capability. And beyond WDS, we have the ability to aggregate multiple radios. So you can take a 16 radio device, I can take three of those radios, aggregate them into a single WDS backhaul between two arrays, I can do that four times over. Hmm. So you can, you can pin up a static mesh network with backhaul between arrays, and we've got m quite a few customers that'll do that. And when you have lots of radios, you can start doing that uh, uh, in, a, in a pretty interesting and unique way, especially when you start bonding radios. Yeah, I would um, I, I would call it like a point-to-point -point mesh, yeah. you know, within the product. But but the key thing here, you know, it's, it's the issue with general mesh is that you are sharing a common channel across multiple access points, right? Say I put the five gig radio, and the uh, the performance on that tends to not scale too well when I just have a two radio device. So here, by dedicating the radios, I can take one or two of those radios. The other ones are all servicing clients, but then I can dedicate those radios for the backhaul, and you don't have that sharing element associated with it. So it's a different concept. We wouldn't, we don't typically call it mesh, but it's it's actually a step above because there's there's plenty of radio bandwidth to be able to to allocate. Great example. Uh, Port of Houston has. 50 of our eight radio devices mounted up at 100 feet on their, on their light poles. Um, and they've got 
I think less than 10 of those are backhauled with fiber into their network. The rest, they have dedicated radios between them forming a point-to-point -point mesh. Uh, so probably half the radios are servicing downlink and half the radios are forming this mesh. That's a, you know, one interesting outdoor example of that. How high did you say those were up? Um, I'm trying to think, Mike. They're like 75. They're 75, yeah. 80 feet. And the application is, is, you know, they're not feeding s stuff on the ground. They're those big okay. cranes. They're feeding the, cran the yeah, crane the cranes. Yeah, those are. I have a Twitter question for you. Sure. Uh, how do you handle layer three roaming? So layer three roaming, we talked about the, the, the online protocol between the arrays where they are actually sharing information. Um, we can share that same information across layer three boundaries. And if need be, if you configure for layer three roaming, uh, your, your traffic can be tunneled back to an array in your original subnet for ingress and egress. Is that, is that pre-done or statically set up? Or is it dynamic as a phone call moves? How does one array know who its next one hop neighbor is going to be before the handoff? And if I'm running, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I'll produce the key caching. You can yes. deal that between arrays as well? Correct. Mm -hmm. So we handle key caching between arrays. We handle the layer through roaming between arrays. And it can be uh, configured either statically, that's an option, or you can have it all done automatically and the arrays that are within earshot. If I can hear your beacons from one array to another, I know you're my neighbor, I'm sharing information with you. And then that information sort of gets pushed out as the station is roaming through the network, then it's being shared with the next group of arrays that are within earshot of the first one. So if I'm associated to one array, it's going to tell XMS, who's going to tell the other array? Right now, actually, I mean, does no. it go through or does it go direct between it goes the direct between arrays. the arrays. The tunnels are formed between the arrays. XMS is not in the data path at all. It's basically there for configuration and monitoring. If the XMS goes down or is taken away, the network still operates uh, 100%. And how do your arrays uh, on the wired side become neighbors? Is that a static definition? I, obviously, over the air, they can hear each other. Right. But if they're on different layer three networks? So one of two things. If they're on li different layer three networks, you can either statically pin it up, or if they hear static. each other, they can discover each other. But on different layer three networks, that's obviously not going to happen, right? No, they do, actually. They share that information across the air, and it allows each array to figure out where the other one is and establish a tunnel to it. So it's similar to, to what the C guys call over the air provisioning? Sure. Okay. You think of it that way. Okay. Yeah, but there's enough information in the information elements that are being exchanged over the air that they, they can find each other, even if they're on different layer three subnets. Okay. And or tunneled over those subnets. Yeah, they'll be, right. they'll be the tunneled wire. back and Sure, the wire as well. But they got to yeah. find each other. We have our own so. protocol, XRP, that's specifically for exchanging that data. It's, it's how many elements. It's a, a lot of information that is ultimately shared so that you're pre-caching the PMKs. You're, you, know, you have very quick roams, right. whether it's layer two or layer three. But yours, yours was a, discussion, a, a, a question about discovery. About discovery, yeah. Right. And how do the neighbors know? They can that discover area. each other over the air. Over the air. Okay. Uh, or you can configure it through XMS. Okay. And passpoint support, hotspot 2.0, yes. SC11U. Mm -hmm. have that, have that shipping, shipping today, good shipping to go. Today, shipping certified today. last year. Yeah, yeah. certified okay, last year. Um, and then the other question I had was regarding SC11 AC design um, for or retrofitting, I suppose, of existing units. Um, if you. Uh, what's the recommendation? Is it to forklift all of your radios when they come out? Because obviously if you're only going to have some operating in 2.4 gigahertz non able to live in AC, is there a need to forklift those radios? What are you advocating to your, to your end users? And so what we've found, is, and, and, and hats off to the marketing people, I wouldn't have thought this possible, but they are selling empty slots. And so we actually have a fairly large number, I'm going to say almost close, close to 50% of the arrays that we've been selling have going out with empty slots. You buy a four, an eight radio array with four empty slots, or you buy a 16 radio array with eight empty slots, even selling four radio arrays with two empty slots. And the promise of that and what's being pitched is that you can come back after the fact and add AC radios to the empty slots. So our recommendation, as, as perceived by you, is not forklift upgrade every radio in your, in your network, certainly not in the near term, you're not gonna need that but just add the radios, um, and we've got lots of customers looking to do it because they have the empty slots, add the radios to the empty slots. Okay. And, in those, and the load balancing algorithm in an AC world is designed to actually put AC clients on the AC radio and steer the 11 in and lower clients to the other radios. So if I have a mix of radio hardware in my, in my array, 
the, the algorithm will actually try to give the best experience to the AC, radio, uh, AC uh, clients by keeping them together on the AC radius. AC radius, okay. That's kind of the picture here is where <laughs> you really have the ability to segment okay. the user types. And that, now that we're with, a, with AC, you have B, A, G, N, 2, 4, N, 2, 5, Five and, and AC. AC. I mean, it, it's just a, this huge amount of different potential clients. I mean, there's not a lot of 11B out there anymore, but the, sure. the fact that I can steer these and put them on their own lanes is going to help a lot with AC especially, because I don't have somebody in the fast lane, you know, slowed down by, by a really slow sure. client, which is detrimental. I mean, it, would, it impacted <coughs> 11N pretty significantly when it came out. With 11AC, you're going to certainly have those challenges again. Okay. It, well, speaking of a hot mess inside of your AP, what's your, <laughs> what's your long-term vision once wave two hits, and you're talking about 160 megahertz wide channels? Right. Uh, talk about right. on your 16 uh, radio AP, right? right? If you envision a 16 radio AP, three radios and 2.4 non-overlapping channels, yep. and how many radios at 160 megahertz? <laughs> and, and Michael talked to this, but I think our, 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 our simple answer is in dense applications, and frankly in, in probably many enterprise applications, channel bonding is going to work against you from a channel planning point of view. Sure. Even today, in some of our applications, we recommend leaving 20 megahertz wide channels and not going to 40, so for to uh, to get better channel isolation, better and better channel planning. And so with 11 AC, um, I think, gosh, even today, you, you bond at 80 megahertz, you're only going to get three usable channels, right. five gig. Um, and you know, knock on wood, the FCC is going to clear up some more. Assuming your client supports it, right. Mm -hmm clear up some more space and, and, and provide that to us. So I think the, the, the simple answer is in, in applications with, for high density, it's probably best not to bond channels or to bond no more than 40 meg. Um, and to your point, a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the phones, a lot of the tablets, a lot of the smaller mobile devices don't have the ability to bond. Only a few of them have the ability to bond to 40 megahertz today, and I think very few will have the ability to go to, to 80 or 160. Okay. But in, in that particular case, I think 160 is going to become a home technology. You know, deploy it in your house, but in the enterprise, it's going to, it's going to destroy your channel planning capability. Okay. Mm -hmm. we, we just escaped three channels at 2.4, and we're going hmm. back to three channels at 5 gig when they're 80 meg wide. Yeah. <laughs> Please, no. Quick question. Um, on the, the modules, I noticed there are little connectors for look like external antennas. Uh, what are those for? So those small little Hiroshi connectors are there for calibration. They're used okay. in, a, in a calibration. We do have versions of that radio hardware that have SMA connectors on them that are being used in our outdoor devices. Okay. And from there, we'll take them out to either a, a, a TNC or a, an end connector on the outside of the, of the device. But those are for calibration at the factory? That's for calibration. And that's for early calibration. Um, our volume radios, we've designed and patented a special fixture that will do calibration uh, wirelessly. So you get a, basically, you take an array, you populate it with radios, and it spins it in front of a, a special purpose-built antenna and does the calibration uh, wirelessly. OK. I have a kind of crazy question. Sure. I like Mo crazy moving questions. to end with multipath. It, since each of these individual radios has its own set of multipath, but there's another one sitting right here, have you found anything that the multipath is actually coming into a different radio, the reflection? So you're getting split spatial streams between radios. That would be cool, but the answer is no. And each of the radios on the front end, it's tuned to a specific frequency. So in any, any multipath coming, bouncing around, the other radios are ignoring those. So as long as they're so, but it'd be kind of cool if we could figure out a way to, to gather up all of that multipath information and, uh, and use it all to reconstruct a signal. But the answer is no. Right now, we're, we're not using multipath information on separate radios to, mm -hmm. uh, to build a, a, rebuild a signal on the first one. Question for you. Is there any, um, anything on the roadmap or that you can talk about that um, kind of combines the 2.11 and the mobile stuff in any way at all? cellular backhaul, any kind of small cell uh, integration, you know, anything at all? So we have the hotspot 2.0, which means we're, we're certainly looking at that space. And, and if you take a look at the, the chassis, the array chassis, those are general purpose slots. And there's nothing that limits them to just 802.11 in radio technology. So you can conceive of additional radio technologies that could be snapped in there to do some of those other things that you're talking about. 
We haven't announced anything, and uh, I think I'll stop here. <laughs> you want to wink? The marketing a little? guy hits me with the. Uh, Give me a little wink there. Before the marketing guy <laughs> hits me with the the wink. Hug. So no, it's 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 certainly something we've thought about, um, and I think that ends up, frankly, being less of a technology issue, becomes more of a go-to-market issue. You got to find the right partners, the right people to go to work with to make that technology work. But certainly, it's a possibility, and I think that the the applications are fairly obvious. So, so. Um, Going back to the 802.11ac part, uh, I, I assume that you could potentially upgrade uh, an 8 array radio to all 11ac. If those radios were all operating at 80 megahertz, that would basically, even with the FCC giving us all these extra channels they're talking about. It's called a hot mess. We, <laughs> we've got one array that does every channel that's available in 5 gigahertz. Fair enough. And And what you would find is if I take an eight radio chassis, mm. I've got eight radios to work with. The typical, I believe, the typical deployment would be one radio dedicated as a full-time threat sensor. By the way, I didn't mention that. Out of the box, mm -hmm. every one of these devices with four or more radios, one of them is, is pre-configured as a full-time threat sensor. Then one radio is a threat sensor, three radios operating at 2.4, and the other four radios can be operating at AC. Okay. So even if I put AC radio, an AC radio is dual band. I can, I can flip it to 2.4, 11N, um, or I can flip it back to 5. So I think in an 8 radio array, if I wanted to use 80 megahertz wide channels, that would be my configuration. Okay. And okay. that would be assuming we still get enough spectrum to be able to open up the fourth uh, 80 megahertz wide channel. Mm -hmm. okay. So your horizontal plane uh, antenna pattern gives the perception that you're shooting out these beams of coverage over the top of everybody's heads. What does your vertical pattern look like? Ver vertical is, is a little is a little wider. You notice that this this reflector is really working in in this plane. Sure. So when you look at the vertical pattern, it's actually wider. So you so you're not influencing any artificial down tilt or anything like that. It's just a it's just a big first generation product did have down tilt and we found it was Rarely Not needed, rarely used, and so this now does, doesn't have any vertical tilt. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we use that to our advantage for coverage up and down, obviously, and right. above and below floors. A lot of times we'll skip a floor, you know, because you have coverage up and down. Sure. Do you end up having problems with um, right below the array? In terms of interference or? Yeah. Or, or just lack of coverage? Lack of coverage oh, no. or um, co-channel. I mean, if you've got a real wide, you know, E-plane, and you're right below, you can potentially get a lot of a lot of overlapping channels directly below the array? No, I mean, they're not overlapping. Every array is going to have its own separate individual set of channels, right? You never replicate the same channel in the a given array. But, you don't want them 150 feet up in the air, but, you know. That's, that's a very good point. You, the, all radios have to be on unique channels. You do not reuse channels within an array. Okay, so if you have a 16 AP or 16 AP array, right, you've got to have a 20 meg wide channel. You're only going to have three and uh, three 2.4 radios and right, yeah. only three, right, right. These are I, I we we skipped over these. These are, are great points. There is no channel reuse in an array. One channel uh, used only once. 2.4, you can only have three. Um, in Europe, you can do four if you space them at the one, five, nine, thirteen. Uh, the 2.4 gig radios are forced to be no closer than 90 degrees. Can't have them adjacent. And the, two, and the 5 gig channel planning algorithm will, will try to space the adjacent ones at 120. You can manually configure them otherwise. We recommend against it. The 5 gig channel planning is fairly complex to do by hand. So tell us when to stop because I'm, we yeah. can keep going all day, yeah. right? Yeah, I was just going to say we're, we're, we need to get to the last section. So okay. great right questions. Here, yeah. um, I, I would bounce back. I think a key point is from the them. architecture of the array to show them the bounce back to what the underlying hood of the processors are right here. Just, just yeah, just a oh. quick summary on that. Yep. Yep. What dr what's driving this? I think is a key point. You know, I, I, th actually, thank you, Mike. This brings up a great point. If you look at the processing power we have at the edge, starting from everything. Everything, even our two radio arrays are dual core processors, all the way up to six cores. And if you think about running applications like DPI, when we distribute that to the edge, we're running DPI. You think about 16 radio arrays, you've got six cores per, put 100 of those. I've got 600 cores doing my DPI, as opposed to something in the core of the network 
that might even, let's go crazy, say it's a 16 core processor, I've still got an order of magnitude more compute power at the edge the way we've built this. And DPI is a great example of that. There are other, there are other aspects of things, you know, your, your firewall throughput and things that can run right out at the edge. So that's been a, a key design consideration is make sure we put enough horsepower at the edge to do all of these forward-looking applications. And then the, the uplink scale as well. So I don't know if we mentioned <coughs> that the, uh, the large array has a 10 gig interface 10 gig. on there. So you can do four 1 gigs and or 10 gig in addition. So we have some convention center customers who are back hauling fiber to these arrays and uh, running obviously larger capacity. One other thing, we know we're, uh, we got to get to the last section here, but this is one of the other interesting things you can do with the array. If I, have, if I don't have all the slots populated, I can pick and choose where I want to put the radio cards themselves. So you can have different uh, configurations for uh, uh, being on the wall, looking into a building, being in a hallway, looking up and down. That's uh, a fairly unique. And we've, we're seeing more and more of that with this generation product where it's easy to snap the radios in and out and move them around. So with that, let me just uh, wrap up with a quick summary here. So would love to have more time. This is a great conversation. And so we'll have to come back. And I'll bring the RF engineers next time. So and uh, RF 101 and talk about all the antenna design and, and uh, mitigating the co-channel and so forth. From uh, just a, a basic architectural approach, we've really tried to do for Wi-Fi what the chassis-based switch did for Ethernet take you up from just point products that are throwaways to something where you have, actually have an investment in your chassis and you can change your radio technology. Think of these as line cards that I can slap a different radio in as needed. And that allows us to have a bunch of product in the field today that's AC ready. We're pre-selling our AC radios today because people know that when they receive them they can snap them into their, uh, uh, into their array uh, and away they go. So thank you very much.